Thank you, Dr. Crane. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Great to be back on campus. I, I get here all the time because I am a trustee. I also have two children here who are students and are enjoying their time here. I'm also very pleased to have my wife, who was also my classmate in the class of 1975, join me today and make me more nervous than I would be normally. So, uh, then you were a better student. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful also to Dr. Crane for not com commenting more on my academic record. Uh, more, more, more importantly, I appreciate the excellent research that uh, you students have all done uh, because you've set the table well. And for my part, I come, as they say, with some skin in the game. As my father was head of the John M. Owen Foundation from 1982 to 2000, and I can speak to you from my knowledge directly from this situation as I had a, a front row seat. So I, dis I propose a discussion in three areas. First, a brief history of philanthropy in this <coughs> most generous nation on earth. We'll look at the ideas and traditions that fueled the growth of private giving to over 300 billion roughly today, with 70% coming from individuals. And there are actually over 1.9 million nonprofit organizations, even though it's at 1.5 million uh, registered with the IRS, that number varies, not all of them are actually registered as 501c3s. Then we'll look at the strategies of nonprofits as they developed left and right politically. And third, we'll see how the challenging economic environment is impacting these nonprofits and driving change and transformation, all of which should lead to some conclusions about which strategies work best. And I'll hopefully leave plenty of time for some questions and conversation. First, a little history. It was really the most natural outgrowth of the American idea, namely that our people and nation were forged in freedom. Our forefathers and mothers risked their lives to come to this land because they believed that America was unique, not just different, but better than any other place. They believed, as we still do today, that in this country, whether you are a craftsman, an entrepreneur, a mezzo-soprano, you have the possibility to rise as high as your God-given talents will take you. But the flip side of freedom is responsibility, personal responsibility and civic responsibility, our shared responsibility to our nation. Responsibility not just because it was and is the right thing to do to defend freedom and do unto others as you would have them do unto you, but it is because the essential thing to do. The founders had studied history's failed attempts to establish representative governments, most notably in Greece and the Roman Empire. They saw that for all the good intentions, human nature was inevitably prone to weakness, sometime even wickedness. And they concluded that their best hope for America, what George Washington called the great experiment, was, a place, was to place limits on government and to encourage individuals to take responsibility for themselves and importantly for each other. Thomas Jefferson said that eternal vigilance is the price of freedom. Thomas Paine wrote that those who expect to reap the blessings of freedom must undergo the fatigue of supporting it. James Madison told us that if men were angels, no government would be necessary. But if angels were to govern men, no internal or external controls on government would be necessary. And wise old Ben Franklin warned that those who will give up essential liberty to obtain temporary security deserve neither liberty nor security. With wisdom and courage in, large, in ways large and small, they pushed forward this great experiment, so-called by George Washington, and they began to build the moral foundations of freedom. They did it heroically by risking their lives to cross the Delaware in a snowstorm and marching in blood-soaked feet to the battle of the British in, on Christmas night. They did it in simpler ways, volunteering as members of the country's first volunteer fire department, started by Ben Franklin in Philadelphia. That's a tradition that lives on today in countless towns and communities that maintain volunteer fire departments across America. 
During the Revolutionary War, volunteer groups sprang up across the colonies to raise funds for the war effort. Boycott products from England show their philanthropic spirit and patriotism. In the 1830s, young people in churches organized nationwide relief programs to help the homeless and citizens victimized by unforeseen circumstances. <coughs> they were inspired by the memories and history of the Great Awakening a century before. That movement swept through the colonies as part of a spiritual reaction against complacency and apathy. It emboldened the colonists against English rule. That was called the Second Great Awakening in the 1830s, motivated churchgoers once again to rekindle their faiths. Churches and their members also became more active in supporting broader reform movements like abolition, women's suffrage. By the latter half of the 19th century, nonprofits we all know today, the American Red Cross, the YMCA, the United Way, they were all created, followed by Kiwanis, Rotary, the Lions Club in the early 20th century. The Great Depression created another great surge in volunteerism as America's darkest days were met with bright lights of hope and help. Innovations like soup kitchens and bread lines helped millions of people who lacked life's simplest necessities of food and shelter. Perhaps the prime example of private giving actually generating transformational, transformational change was education. <clears throat> the movement took root in the 19th century and continues to this day. Adam Meyerson, president of the Philanthropy Roundtable, notes that unlike drives today that appeal to people's guilt or that urge them to give back, the drive to finance higher education appealed directly to people's ideals, aspirations, and religious principles. By the 19th century, America realized that a strong, secure republic required an educated citizenry with character, knowledge, and leadership to govern themselves within a free nation. Pretty soon, virtually every town wanted its own college. Civic leaders everywhere stepped up and began to build them. As I am confident you all know, Lafayette College was one of them in 1824, thanks to the leadership of James Madison Porter. James Porter was a leading member of Easton back in those days, and his father had fought with the Marquis at the Battle of Brandywine. During the 19th century, great American philanthropists like Andrew Carnegie, Johns Hopkins, Leland Stanford, James Buchanan Duke, led the drive to create and endow institutions that are world leaders today. But they had plenty of help. Americans from all walks of life stepped up and donated whatever, small amounts, $10, $5, they were all like little platoons. Their generosity opened new doors of opportunity for all and established institutions that would not discriminate on the basis of race, sex, or religion. To give you one example, by 1880, Ohio, with 3 million inhabitants, had 37 colleges. In contrast, at the same time, England, with 23 million people, had four degree-granting institutions. To sum up, the great, institution, the great traditions of private generosity were born in the spirit of the American Revolution, became part of the American character, they cut across socioeconomic lines, they involved a wide range of charitable activities, and for the first two centuries, they were largely non-political. Much of that began to change by the late 1960s. During the 60s, Leaders on the left launched new challenges against ideas and traditions that had been embraced by Americans throughout history. They challenged the idea that the federal government should be limited in size, power, and responsibilities, and should not encroach upon states and municipalities. They challenged the idea that individuals working within communities and organizations should remain the principal source of compassion and assistance for the poor, sick, and disabled. They demanded more activist strategies emanating from the federal government. During President Johnson's Great Society, the government moved to appropriate many traditional responsibilities it sought 
to become the primary engine of economic change and the arbiter of morality and justice. An alliance on the left between government activists and like-minded nonprofits joined forces to demand greater assistance, both as a matter of right and as compensation for what they perceived as past injustices. Their strategy was not to appeal directly to the people in the grassroots, nor did they engage in the battle of ideas. Rather, they lobbied for large sums of money in the form of government grants and contracts from both the federal and state governments. For many groups, these funds have become a key source of income and involve a reciprocal relationship. As the groups receive money, they advocate for more money, which is the source of their livelihood. The federal grant system has become a kind of a modern form of patronage by which supporters receive financial support in return. Some examples. Planned Parenthood cites 1966 as an historic turning point in its struggle to gain federal support for family planning. By 2008, Planned Parenthood reported annual revenue of more than $1 billion of which nearly $350 million was paid for by the taxpayers, all of us. Obviously, abortion is a very controversial subject, and understandably, those who are strongly pro-choice may see nothing wrong with the federal <coughs> government involved in supporting Planned Parenthood to this degree. But others, including many people who are strongly pro-life, clearly do disagree with it. Another example, ACORN, created in 1970 grew into the nation's largest community organizing group with the help uh, in the form of millions in support of federal agencies like Census and HUD. The National Urban League, founded in 1910, counts over 100 affiliates in 36 states. In 2008, received some 40% of its revenues from the federal government. Among all the nonprofits, the lead ships in the convoy were great foundations like Ford, Rockefeller, and Carnegie Foundations. The granddaddy, the Ford Foundation, was established in 1936 with over $13 billion in assets, and it has functioned almost as a government unto itself ever since. In the 1960s and 70s, the foundation began veering to the left under the regime of McGeorge Bundy the president from 1966 to 1979. The foundation created a strategy of advocacy philanthropy and invested in a maze of activist groups that, as mentioned, lobbied for funding of their respective causes and, importantly, sought to influence the regulatory bodies and federal courts that implemented the laws. Thus, the strategy endeavored to institutionalize far-reaching change while de-emphasizing, indeed, even circumventing the electoral process. Clearly then, by the end of the 1960s, the country had come a long way from the early days of Ben Franklin's fire brigades. You could say that we were moving from the great experiment to the great expansion. However, it was precisely this lurch to the left that ultimately provoked a powerful counterattack by the philanthropists and the foundations on the right. Enter the John Olin Foundation and others. The one I know best is the John Olin Foundation because my father ran it for 30 years. John Olin, fabulously successful businessman, had an epiphany in the 1960s. He, surfe he surveyed what he called the creeping stranglehold of socialism, and he decided that he had to fight back. Ironically, a key catalyst for the Olin Foundation's future growth was Henry Ford's dramatic decision in 1977 to resign from the board of the Ford Foundation, which his father had founded. Listen to his parting words in his letter of resignation. This is Henry Ford. The foundation exists and thrives, he wrote, on the fruits of our economic system. The dividends of competitive enterprise make it all possible. In effect, the foundation is a creature of capitalism, a statement that I'm sure would be shocking to many professional staff people 
in the field of philanthropy. It is hard to discern recognition of this in anything the foundation does. Those were his words, shocking words. John Olin read Henry Ford's words and vowed that his foundation would communicate those realities in everything his foundation did. The man who helped make that possible was my father. He had written a book called A Time for Truth that caught John Olin's eye. Time for Truth challenged businesses to stop subsidizing our own destruction. John Olin not only embraced Dad's book, he asked him to run the Olin Foundation. Unlike most of the nonprofits I've described, the Olin Foundation did not solicit money. Rather, it gave money away. Its focus was unusual for foundations at that time. With its emphasis on private giving and free market capitalism, and suspicion about government encroachment in areas best left to individuals in their communities, such as, char such, such as charity and philanthropy, it is worth asking why it is so unusual for the wealthy to support the system that generates the wealth. It happens to be true that most foundations are liberal in approach. It's true for Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, most new millionaires and billionaires starting a foundation. Olin differed not only in philosophy, but in its tactics and strategies. For example, it did not hesitate to reach across the partisan divide and build bridges with Democrats disenchanted with liberalism. Looking back, it helped to have the other team stars coming over to our side. It also helped to have star defectors who brought their playbook. Penetrating research and insights and articles by brilliant writers start, who started out on the liberal side of the ledger, like Irving Kristol, Michael Novak, Norman Poderitz. They believed in free markets and personal responsibility over bigger government and growing dependency. They believed in defending freedom in the world over what they considered policies of weakness and moral equivalence. And they stood, by, they stood side by side with businessmen like John Olin and my father. Strengthened by its alliance, Olin built its strategy on three strong pillars. The first pillar, spend resources for the greatest impact in the shortest time. Not wanting to risk a repeat of the Ford Foundation's uh, experience, John Olin term limited the life of the foundation. He mandated that it would close its doors in 2005, and it did. Jim Pearson, Olin's director, said that because of the spend down strategy and the gains made from investments, they were able to dispense money like a $400 million foundation, not a $100 million foundation. But it's not just how much was spent, but how well Olin spent it. Shame the feds won't adopt the same philosophy. The second pillar of the strategy, investing great people in elite universities. In the early days, most of the funding supported small colleges. Berry College in Georgia, Harding College in Arkansas, Hillsdale in Michigan, because of their rigorous curricula and support for individualism. Hillsdale would always be a special case, not only as a conservative institution with great academics, but also as one willing to say no to government subsidies and support. However, Dad and John Olin believed that to change the national debate, we needed to establish Beach Hedge at elite schools. <clears throat> so uh, with conservative scholars. So that made a huge difference in the strategy. Liberal foundations spent tens of millions to pay for advoc advocacy philanthropy. Olin and his peers spent a few million to produce path-breaking research that they sent to the world, often gaining 10 times the impact. The, the examples in hindsight are remarkable. Here are some. Alan Bloom, professor at the University of Chicago. He authored The Closing of the American Mind, a book that received sensational coverage that blamed cultural relativism for the closing of minds in American universities. Dinesh D'Souza, a Dartmouth grad who coined the, the term PC for politically correct and wrote Illiberal Education, the Politics of Race and Sex on Campus. Steve Emerson, who warned long ago that, and continues to warn today about the threats of extremist Islam. Samuel Huntington, a, war, a foreign policy and national security expert at Harvard. He
He wrote a prophetic book in 1996, The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of the World Order. Huntington predicted major global conflicts would occur between nations and different groups of civilization. In addition, Owen supported a multitude of scholars and conservative think tanks like Heritage and the Hoover Foundation at Stanford. And Olin invested in scholars through the John M. Olin Faculty Fellowship Program, providing time to research and write during the pressures of publish or perish on campuses. The third pillar of Olin's strategy, invest to influence the legal world. Olin made two major investments, supporting the growth of the Law and Economics Center. It supported strong support for the Federalist Society. The, the former sought to ensure the law school students understood economics. Some 660 judges have take, take, taken the LEC courses, which is about a third of judges on district courts. The seminars encouraged jurists to apply insights of economics to jurisprudence. The courses were not conservative per se, but advanced the interests of conservative, conservatism by imparting cornerstone principles like property rights. For instance, when new regulations affect the value of property, government should compensate the property holders. And then there was the Federalist Society. The so society was formed in 1982 to support and develop lawyers who believe in the rule of law and the limits of constitutional government as envisioned by our framers. The society assists legal scholars in spending a year writing books and law review articles which essential requirements on a law school tenure tracks. Recently, the society counted more than 25,000 members with student chapters at 150 law schools, four of every five accredited institutions. The influence of the Federalist Society has grown enormously over the past 25 years. So that, in a nutshell, is the history and the strategy of the John M. Owen Foundation, a foundation that made 370 million grants over 30 years, and that not only raised the conservative flag, but revived conservatism itself. Owen was probably outspent 10 to 1, but it proved to be one of the most effective providers of venture capital during the last three decades. Venture capital, which I like to call freedom funds, as they enabled the conservative movement to develop and strengthen its human capital. So that is the genesis, the growth of nonprofits that led to over 300 billion in private giving, the greatest outpouring of generosity in the world, as well as the strategies of nonprofits left and right. With that said, Let's conclude with the challenges from the current environment, which is different. It's impacted many operations and forced difficult reorganizations. Taking it back a few years, at the top, foundations still increased in 2008. It was up about 2.8%. However, in 2008, assets dropped. They dropped nearly 22%. That caused a regrouping, and so giving began to, to falter. As indicated in your study that, uh, that I read, which was very well written, philanthropy has declined in 2009 and probably is flattish in 2010, although the numbers haven't been published yet. The reality is that these, this, you know, this triple whammy that's occurred, the economy and you know, donations may be down, but government funding is also down. And the need is still there, in many cases still up. And in terms of strategies for these organizations that are hitched their stars to the government when funds are flush, they are the most vulnerable today. A Michigan study of nonprofits reveals that 45% of organizations that receive government funding experience delays in scheduled payments from the government, and many are being negatively affected. Nearly three quarters of nonprofits in Washington, D.C which receive most of their funding from government sources, have had less than three months of operating reserves. Very important fact. 
These organizations also had a higher percentage uh, uh, with no operating reserves, about one-third, compared to groups relying primarily on private contributions. It seems that while government may fund an organization with seed money, up to approximately 25% of its budget, funding beyond that point, in time, leads to private donations diminishing almost dollar for dollar. This is known as crowding out, and it's most prevalent among the social and human service charities. By the way, let me note that there is another form of crowding out by government funding. In the 1950s and 60s, medical research was largely funded by private philanthropy. Today, the annual budget for the National Institute of Health is $40 billion, which dwarfs the sum private donors give, dwarfs. The same is true in higher education, which was once the province of private donors. As government funding expands, private spending declines. The decrease in personal donation also underscores the link between an individual's personal and political beliefs and his or her willingness to sustain, sustain support for private charities. Across the nonprofit universe, we have seen a shakeout. Diana Aviv, who heads up the independent sector, a coalition of 600 nonprofits, likens it to the animal kingdom. At some point, weaker organizations will not be able to survive. To avoid that fate, thousands of nonprofits are facing up to the realities that for nonprofit enterprises, they must, you know, just like for profit, they must confront every day. They're working to adopt smart and viable business plans. They're cutting costs, streamlining their processes, and when necessary, they are restructuring, consolidating, and merging with other organizations. Four years ago, five years ago now, Big Brothers and Big Sisters of Metropolitan Chicago was dependent upon government and United Way support for two-thirds of its budget. After merging four affiliates into one, it succeeded in forming partnerships with 10 companies and now receives 95% of its revenue from private funding. Girl Scouts of USA merged five Indiana councils in 2007 and now has sufficient funds to hire a fundraising team, something they could never afford to individually. So, no question, we are living through a, a difficult period. But the reality is winning organizations find answers for tough problems. Winners know that it may be difficult, but it's possible. The best organizations see challenges as opportunities. Opportunities in the case of nonprofits to bring out the better angels of our nature. That will help the best to survive and prosper for the future. With a sound plan, compelling message, and dedicated people, nonprofits can secure the private backing they need and provide services that are better and more strongly supported than ever before. They will overcome, which is something else we learned from our founding fathers. With all that said, I want to thank you all for inviting me to be with you today. And I'd be delighted to take some questions and share with you some of my experience in running a medium-sized foundation for the last 10 years. Foundation at that point 
said, if, if you don't shut down this operation, the, the, the University of Virginia, you'll <coughs> never get an, not only another dime from us, but they were also heavily wired into the, the whole network of, of philanthropic groups. Right. So we're, we're going to shut off all funding to the University of Virginia if you don't shut it down. So it was, it was really like they're all, it was like a government leveraging and saying, and, and the group just left. They just, It's too bad. It's a tough battle. It is a tough battle. And oftentimes, money can sway people to do things that they, that are, are contrary to their principles, which is a shame. Um, but that's, you know, people do that sometimes. Well, real simply, the Ford Foundation got all their funding from the, obviously, the, the, the uh, production of the Ford Motor Company. All, you know, it was all Ford Motor Stock, so all, you know, profits from the capitalist system, okay? So Henry Ford, the original, founded the Ford Foundation, and, you know, their mission was to help the poor and, you know, those that were needy. And then... The social movement that I referred to in the in the in the 50s and the 60s sort of took hold, and the Ford found this is what you know this and you know McGeorge Bundy, who was I think chief of staff under JFK, took over the Ford Foundation, and you know this is sort of what he engineered. That was the current thinking of the time. And Henry Ford woke up one day and said, "Why are we so mad at profits? What's wrong with profits? This is how we got the money." Well, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with profits, you know. I'm not saying that there aren't people that got profits ill, you know, in a bad way, but this money is supposed to be used in a good way. So let's try to do it intelligently. No, they turned on the whole free enterprise system. Yeah, as if it's pejorative. And the, the other thing, there, there was a slide that you had in your presentation that I, I caused me to actually do quite a bit of research, and I sent a ream of information to you that provides basically one characteristic that I want to impart to you all. Giving in this country is not driven by tax rates. It's driven by people's generosity, desire to help something that they feel passionate about, and their ability because they've made money. So. When people say that if tax rates go down, generosity will go down. Okay, well, in 1982, Ronald Reagan cut tax rates from 78% from to 20%. Guess what? Giving went way up. Why? Because net income went way up because they were being taxed less. That's the way, that's the way philanthropy really is driven. And research after research, and there's 10 studies in here that I've sent you all. I sent to Dr. Crane, and he, you can get it. Proves it. Which is, it's usually important in the debate now about tax reform because a lot of nonprofits are worried that if we do have a flat tax or reduce this exemption, how is that going to affect us? It's really important. We are an incredibly generous country. We are compassionate. We love the underdog. That's who we are. We want to help. We want to help. We do help. Well, every one of you that whose bio I heard, you, you did something in your bio for something, somebody else in your experience here at Lafayette. And, and I'm sure all of you did. Why? Because it's in your mentality. And it, it's all of our psyche to help. And God bless you for it. Well, they're, they're because of the wealth that's been created and the family office uh, industry that's burgeoned from that really since the 90s, the, the tech age, and then this 
you know, all the wealth that's been created in the, you know, since 2001. There have been lots of these foundations created and family offices. And, uh, you know, this wealth management phenomenon. You know, when I started in the business in 1975, the term wealth management was unheard of. Wealth management is now, today, a very big business. And the, they were just brokers. That's what a broker was. You were just a customer's man. You know, you just go and smile and dial and, you know, try to write tickets and, you know, that's the way it worked. Now, today, you're trying to bring, have people give you their money and, you know, teach them asset allocation and teach them, you know, you know, teach them not to worry when things happen like 08 and things like that. But um, there are opportunities in the nonprofit industry. You know, I, there is a competitive world out there of, um, you know, salary comparisons. You know, if, uh, we have a foundation that we give away $10 million a year. We make 300 grants. We employ four people full time. Um, we pay those people salaries based upon salary surveys that are, we get from consulting firms that tell us what everybody pays. People like the Ford Foundation, but not the big ones, because we're a, we're a $250 million foundation, so we, we sort of compare ourselves to our peers. So, um, but that, that's what you end up doing. You just end up boiling it down to what you compare yourself to, and you pay it. And, and, um, if, if we were to hire a Lafayette grad, which we're not, but if we were, you know, no, but I mean, um, you know, we're not, we're not actually looking for anybody at the moment, but if we were, we would pay a competitive wage. You'd be able to support yourself living in New York City. You wouldn't get rich. Do, would, you get, would you make money like you would at the investment banks or the consulting firms? No, but that's not what you're doing. You, you, you know, you're trying to, you know, you, you make a decision that you actually want to be part of making the world a better place, living your life, you know, it's, you're not going to work all night long, you know, three nights a week. You're, you're not going to have somebody screaming and yelling at you and, you know, giving you performance uh, reviews, you know, on the, you know, with the back of his hand. And, you know, it's just a different life. But there's lots of it out there. And in colleges, th there was one bio that uh, someone's going to Villanova to study uh, phila philanthropy or, or uh, right. so nonprofit administration. That was unheard of. Uh, maybe it was called public administration, uh, you know, 40 years ago. Today, all these schools, all these great schools have these nonprofit administration um, disciplines. And we need it because we are growing. We're a large, generous country, and we are, we are a country that gives away a lot of money. Now, I know in 2009 it went down, but it's still a couple hundred billion dollars. That's a lot of dough. There are a lot of people giving money away. So, you know, if you're interested in the industry, it's, it's, it's one to pursue. Um, I wasn't referring to crowding out in a sense that it caused that giving institution to go out of business. What I was saying was once that, inst the, the, you know, let's just take an institution like Covenant House, okay, which is a homeless, you know, they, they take in the homeless youth. And let's just say that they're donations were 25% from government and 75% from private. And then suddenly the government decided they wanted to really start giving to homeless and their donations started going, you know, more from the government. So as the donations went to more like 50 and 60%, the private donations tend to go down. That doesn't mean the, that doesn't mean the sources dry up and don't give the money away. They just give to something else. Right? And so 
But what happens when, when you have a, you know, like here we are today, we got a billion, a trillion, almost a true two trillion dollar deficit. So we know the cuts are coming. And these social, giant social programs we have, like Planned Parenthood, are going to get cut. Why? Because they have to. Everything has to get cut. It's all too big. You know, a lot of it's great stuff, but it's too big. We're spending more than we make. It's just simple. None of us live like that, but the government does. So we got to change it. And everybody knows it. That's what's going to happen. So now these nonprofits that might have 60, 70, 80% of their income from a government grant, all of a sudden, pff, that's bad. So the first thing you would learn as a nonprofit or as a business is you need to diversify your customer base. You need to diversify your giving, right? If you're selling cut pr products to a customer or you're raising money from, the, from, a, from a population, the most important thing to do is not to be too dependent on one source. You know, not to have one customer you know, or one source. And if the government's the biggest source, you're in danger. That's your threat. You know, the strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats, that's a threat. Anybody else? Well, what are you specifically referring to? Because um, are you talking about a organization that is trying to get money from foundations, like a charity, like a homeless, you know, a, a home for unwedded mothers? Or are you talking about a public foundation that raises money to do good things in society? Okay, and your worry and, and your concern is what? That they, that they have to compete for money? Yeah. You know, we live in a meritocracy. That's what the system is. You gotta wake up and smell the coffee. You gotta figure out the system, figure out where the money's coming from, and go for it. That, you know, I mean, it's not gonna come to you if you don't go for it. I don't know. That's, you know, that's, that's the world. But there is 300 billion out there, and it's going somewhere. You gotta get your piece of it. Oh yeah, you have you have to have a, a a mission that makes perfect sense, that's succinct, that can be explained in an, in an elevator ride. You have to have an action plan that's understandable by the employees of the organization. And then you have to have a constituency that is reached and communicated with regularly by the, you know, the people that are in charge of communicating. And then you, your money will flow. That's the way it works. And if you don't communicate with your constituency, the money starts sh shutting down. That's the way it works. Right. That aren't there some people that would argue that uh, in a way you're getting some unfair advantages in the sense of uh, don't you get exempted from taxes, say? Or I mean, is there a, are there cases where a nonprofit can have a, a do some harm to the for-profit sector when they're trying to go head to head? Well. Sure. I, you look, I know uh, Morristown Memorial sure. very well. It's a not-for-profit hospital. I am chairman of the foundation that funds all sorts of projects to the hospital. The hospital is a 600-bed hospital doing roughly $750 million of revenues per year. Um, we 
you know, break even to make a, as much as a 2 or 3% margin, that's a great margin, um, and we sometimes lose money. Every penny that we make gets plowed back into the hospital. That's what a not-for-profit does. A for-profit pays the money out to shareholders or somehow repatriates it to the shareholders. Um, for a Morristown for, not-for-profit hospital to hurt a for-profit hospital, I guess there would have to be a for-profit hospital nearby, and I'm not aware of one, right? Um, so, you know, you, you, have a, you have a plant challenge, right? Because you, you, know, you have to have plants in the same place. Um, you know, I don't know what the breakdown is of not-for-profit and for-profit, but there are lots of for-profit hospitals. And um, the only ones I've ever been affiliated with are not for-profit. And um, I know that we have some tremendous operating challenges coming uh, at us because of Obamacare, uh, because what they're trying to do is um, reduce health care costs by uh, reducing reimbursements, by driving the reimbursements to the Medicare standard from the private, industry, private insurance standard. Um, the way our Marstown Memorial, the way it works, we get a dollar thirty for our dollar of cost from private. And our Medicare reimbursement is 88 cents. So how do you make that work? We have a lot more of these guys than these guys, right? If everybody is enrolled in the system and you, know, you have a lot more of these people showing up at your doors, getting reimbursed here, and these guys are going out of business because I'm a small business employer, right? I'm paying 15000 per employee to insure, right? Why not just let the government take care of it? So that, you know, that's the reimbursement rate. Instead of the guys I pay at 15000 bucks, they're paying that, right? This is, the way, this is what's going on. So um, this, is, this is the push-pull that's, that's going to happen. Um, you know, the for-profit guys, they, they, probably, they, they would tell you they prefer all these guys. We all would. But this is where it needs to be. Obama, I don't agree with a lot of stuff he says, but the one thing I do agree with, we got to get here. This is where we got to get to. He's right. There's too much money sloshing around in the medical system, and it gets wasted. And so we got to get here. But I don't know how we're going to get there. So that's my little. Maybe you could, uh, last time we talked, you were uh, your experience with the Southern partnership here with, uh, with the, the, the city. Sure. And you might comment on that about how nonprofits cooperate with sure. partnership. Sure. OK, so there are two ways to get money from government if you're a nonprofit. So I've been on the board of Covenant House for a long time. Covenant House houses every night in New Jersey 170 kids that show up at our doors. And it's more that we go out in vans and pick them up. These are, these are the population of kids that nobody wants. <coughs> nobody wants. And um, we take them in and feed them, get them clean, and you know, ho hopefully get them taken care of in the legal system, um, get, uh, you know, help them get drug counseling, alcohol counseling, psychological counseling in most cases, uh, you know, all, the, all the type of services that are basically available to them for free. So what we need is buildings. And we need professionals that can do this stuff. So we need to fund it. And the government, Housing and Urban Development, the Federal Housing Authority, and some of these other uh, government authorities offer these programs that build these buildings for us if we commit to fund the operations. So we've built probably 150 beds doing that in the last 10 years. 
And last year, we housed 2,000 kids doing this. And these are really down and out kids. It's really very, very sad. You go, it's heartbreaking to go see these places. Not at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, but at 10 o'clock at night when the proverbial hits the fan. And um, so it's great, but you have to be able to figure out a way to raise the money to pay for the operation of the building, which we do. We raise, a couple, we raise three or four million dollars a year privately and have forever. And that's what we do. So that's the way it works. Now, the other way is to just go for the government grant for operating funds and, and hope that they get it and you play the game by raising money for your senator and doing all that, to all the patronage, and yeah, that's another way to do it. Do they own the building and you lease the building back? No, we actually buy the building and, or buy the land and they pay for the building, but we own it. <coughs> yep. Any other comments? Questions? We get Gabby Vogel, the last uh, commenter. Uh, yeah, I uh, think that we have a program, and I'm going to say the other two that you were just at. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.